Thank you. Uh, what you see before you is the coat of arms of the nation of Australia. And I don't know a lot about coats of arms, but um, I imagine most countries don't put like wimpy ass animals. I don't know that anyone has a vole or a shrew on their coat of arms. And the majestic creature uh, you see on the right there is the native emu. And the emu earned its place on the coat of arms by being tough, by being fast, and by having enough power in its kick to literally shatter your bones. But emus weren't the only badasses in Australia. Um, in the 1920s, uh, there were tens of thousands of World War I veterans who were coming back from the front and they needed to be reintegrated into civilian society. And the Australian government wasn't so top notch about this. Um, it's not like they just handed them a game and said, hey, welcome back, have a cup of coffee. <laughs> no, it's not too soon. My <laughs> oh, God, get a job. So, so, so all these vets come back and Australia doesn't really want to give them money or give them a whole lot of help. They do want to have more, um, a, a bigger agricultural economy in the country. And if Australia has anything, it's loads and loads of land that not many people are doing not much with. So they come up with this, with this idea to help the vets by saying, hey, we'll give you, you know, a big plot of land and as long as you farm it for a decade, it's yours to keep. Now, this was kind of the best thing going for a lot of these folks coming back from the war. So thousands of vets took Australia up, took the government up on the deal. Now, I don't know if you've ever moved to a place that was recently the domain of just wildlife. Um, I happen to live at the edge of a canyon. I get these, this was taken in my living room. I get these visitors from time to time. Oh, no, no one's coming over for drinks, damn it. Okay, and even more, thank you, thank you. God bless you people. And even more infamously, up in the sort of northern extremes of the United States and in um, southern Canada, people have either ill-advisedly or inadvertently um, built homes on top of snake dens, subterranean snake dens. Yeah, yeah, that's real. And if you build your house in the winter over the snakes, you're going to be sleeping with them in your bed come summer. So... Bring it to 1932, um, <laughs> Australia's new farms had to contend with some of the locals too. Uh, and the, uh, one of the area newspapers, the Sunday Herald, put it like this, quote, the enemy is the tough, prolific, gangling marauder of the sand plains whose species has invaded in a frenzy of hunger some of the finest fields at the time of ripening of the harvest to shear off crops with voracious beaks. Now, to be fair, the emus weren't just being assholes. There was a drought in the interior of the country, and it was forcing them to look for new sources of water, new sources of food. And so they headed down kind of towards the southwest, towards Perth, where they found new farms with lots and lots of wheat growing, uh, reservoirs and irrigation ditches, and it was everything that they needed to survive. They're also sloppy eaters, so they trampled about twice as much as they actually ate. Um, and so the farmers were understandably pissed off. And it was compounded by the fact that the depression was setting in in Australia in 1932. Um, and the government had said, hey, keep growing, keep growing that wheat and we're gonna prop up the price, we'll give you some subsidies. And nothing ever came through. So they knew they couldn't count on the bureaucracy to help them out. And a lot of these folks were veterans, so they called up the army. They said, hey guys. <laughs> We've got a problem. We think there are about 20,000 six foot tall birds eating all of our crops. Can you help us out? The army's like, fuck yeah, we got guns. <laughs> so they say, yeah, we'll send down a couple of detachments. Uh, a couple of these, this, is, this was the uh, machine gun, you know, deluxe of the era. It's called a Lewis gun. And so the army sent two detachments of, uh, of gunners down. And all they said was, farmers, you've got to buy the bullets. So they pulled their money and they bought 10,000 bullets. So, November 4th, 1932, under the command of General G.P.W. Meredith, the gunners set up a position and opened fire on the emus. And apparently, they expected the emus to just stand in an orderly line and wait for death. <laughs> the emus did not do this. 
they scattered out of range very quickly. They broke up into smaller groups, and they can, they can run at like 30 miles an hour. So it didn't take them very long at all to get out of range. And these big, heavy guns were just, you know, plucked down in the ground. So they couldn't chase after them. And a lot of those birds were hit with like two, three, four bullets, and they kept on running. It was like it didn't matter. They were just soaking them up. Yeah. Badass, right? So at the end of day one, with 20,000 emus wreaking havoc, they killed about 50. So they took a day off, because, <laughs> you know, that shit's hard. And Major Meredith decides, all right, we need a new plan, so we're going to set up an ambush. So he finds a place where the geography sort of funnel, would funnel the birds down into a place where they have fewer options for running and scattering, and uh, waits for the birds to show up. Now... Again, expectations were maybe not realistic. I think he thought the emus were just gonna not notice the heavily armed bird murderers waiting for them. <laughs> they did notice the bird murderers and they stayed out of range. And so in desperation, some of the farmers actually tried to shoo the birds down towards the trap, imperiling themselves. And after half a day of this, you know, folly, uh, they managed to kill about 12 birds. The gun jammed and they just thought, oh, what's the use? So they gave up for the day. So the next three days, Major Meredith decides, we're going to take this whole operation to the south because, and I swear to you, I'm not making this up, he heard that the birds were more tame down there. So he figures, <laughs> we'll go where the wuss birds are. And uh, he has, predictably, no more luck. He's, he's still not killing birds in any significant numbers. So someone has the bright idea, hey, why don't we mount the guns up on trucks? Which would kind of make sense. It seems good on paper, but remember, this is the 1930s. We've got a 1930s truck. We've got 1930s dirt farm roads in rural Australia, and we've got a World War I gun. So they really didn't have any luck with that. The birds could easily outrun the truck on those shitty roads, and even with all those slugs you know, in their bodies, they're just absorbing it and running and getting out. So we get to November 8th with... 2,500 rounds of ammo expended. The death count, is, there's no official death count, but it's probably in the neighborhood of 250 birds. The army, realizing that this is a complete fool's errand, recalls Major Meredith. But in his uh, official report for this period of, of, the, uh, of the EMU War, he, he makes sure that we, we know no army troops suffered casualties in the fighting. <laughs> God bless them, thank you for your service. Okay, but the farmers were having none of it. They were pissed and they were desperate. So they're like, you guys, they're just dumb birds and you didn't stay long enough and you didn't try hard enough, so just come back, please. And after a few days, the army actually capitulated. They sent good old Major Meredith back with his Lewis guns and they continued their efforts for another 27 days. And in that time, nearly a month, they only managed to kill about 700 more birds and they used 7,500 rounds to... <laughs> do it. So if you're keeping track, they expended about 10 30 caliber rounds for each bird that they killed. These birds were soaking up shots like Lucille Bluth in a drinking contest. They were not going down. Okay, now to be fair, uh, they didn't exactly have SEAL Team 6 on the job. Um, the Sunday Herald Inter uh, interviewed a uh, soldier involved in the operation and he said, quote, there's only one way to kill an emu. Shoot him through the back of the head when his mouth is closed or through the front of his mouth when his mouth is open. Now, it's been established on this very stage that I'm not good at math, but I'm pretty sure he just gave us two ways. And I'm certainly not a veterinarian, but I'm having trouble understanding why if you shoot an animal through its head when its mouth is closed, that's a kill shot. But if he just opens his mouth, it's a survivable wound. But it was uh, GPW Meredith who sort of put most succinctly just how badass these, these emus were when he wrote, quote, if we had a military division with the bullet-carrying capacity of these birds, it would face any army in the world. They can face machine guns with the invulnerability of tanks. 
They are like Zulus whom even dum-dum bullets could not stop. And in case you're not, a dum-dum bullet is like a flesh-destroying, explode-on-impact kind of thing, and uh, you just couldn't kill him. And full disclosure, that is not GPW Meredith. I couldn't find a photo of him. That is, in fact, a soldier from the era, and I, he's pretty good-looking, right? So, I mean, I'm straight, but I could get a man crush going for uh, that guy. So after military failure, finally, a bounty system was set up instead, which was effective in bringing the emu numbers down somewhat, but uh, it never really stopped them. And eventually, Australia turned to fencing to protect their crops from emus, and later still initiated a hunting ban so that you know, neither hunters nor farmers nor uh, army uh, soldiers can shoot at those emus. Not that they cared because you can shoot these badass birds all you like. They've earned their place on that coat of arms and you're not about to get rid of them. So, to the emus and death to Carthage. <laughs> 